very warm welcome to the latest of our Flavor House or Clamor House conversations. Um, I can I just say to all of you that these conversations are, of course, open for people of all faiths and even none at all. And one of the lovely things is that we're able to come here on a Saturday morning and enjoy each other's company and talk about things that really matter, um, whatever our faith background may be. This morning I have the enormous pleasure and indeed honour of introducing one of my very good friends, um, Kenneth Cloak. Ken is, and I can tell you this, one of the heroes in the field in which I work. And I work in the field of how we manage and resolve conflict, and in particular in the world of mediation. And Ken is right there, right at the very top of the tree on an international basis. There will be few people in the world that I occupy who, when they hear the name Ken Cloak, will not bow down and worship. <laughs> <laughs> but that is the significance that this man has had in, in this field, and indeed in the field of how we deal with really difficult situations generally. Ken has written prodigiously, I've got just two or three of the books here, uh, in front of me, and if any of you are inclined to go on to either Ken's website, kencloak.com or Amazon, you'll find these wonderful books. This, this is actually the most recent, The Dance of Opposites. It's a very, very fine uh, gathering together of much of Ken's thinking in recent years. And we'll, we will address some of these points as the, the morning progresses. Uh, Ken comes from California. I'm going to talk a little bit about Ken's life in California and his, his, his journey to where he is now. We launched something called the Commitment to Respectful Dialogue, but we relaunched it. This is a, a formula of eight points that in the independence referendum, our a group called Collaborative Scotland promoted to try to encourage really respectful uh, and non-partisan discussion of the issues. So we have brought that back into a focus this year, and we're looking at a much longer term project now, and we had a number of MSPs, particularly younger generation MSPs, who came along alongside civic leaders on Wednesday evening and signed this pledge to uh, be more respectful in the dialogue. And, and that's just the beginning of a journey, which we'll talk perhaps a little bit about in Scotland, to try to encourage people to talk about difficult issues in a more, a more constructive, courteous and dignified way. And Ken is very much part of that, and has been for many years, part of that movement towards how do we find ways as a species to talk about the really difficult stuff without insulting each other, causing offence or causing hurt. Ken, you're very welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank, Thank you for being here and being part of this morning. Um, what I'd like to do is to start uh, by asking you to tell us a little bit about your journey. And I'd like to go right back to California in the 60s. And Ken was very much involved in the civil rights movement, in the um, anti-Vietnam War movement. And Ken, to take us back into the 60s and the start of your journey, and then we'll move into how you got into mediation and conflict resolution. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me. This is a pleasure to be here. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Can you actually understand my accent? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, supposedly we are uh, two countries divided by a common language, <laughs> so we'll, I'll try to overcome that. Um, I think that the most important part of what you have um, uh, referred to is uh, sort of basic human values. Um, the value of recognizing other human beings as uh, fellow human beings, which implies equality. Uh, equality between races, equality between genders, equality between social classes, uh, equality uh, of uh, people who are healthy and strong and people who are suffering uh, from physical disability or disease. Um, we want to recognize what is human in every person, so what drew me into the civil rights movement was simply the sense that it was unfair to treat people um, 
uh, in the ways that people were being treated in the United States, particularly in the South. So I worked in the South uh, and experienced some of that myself. Uh, I saw it firsthand and it had a profound impact on me. What did you see the first time which had an impact? Well, what I saw was actually two things. Uh, first was uh, people being treated as less than human. Um, and secondly, the incredible courage um, and uh, strength of people in being able to um, take a stand in favor of a non nonviolence, which is actually just a statement that says we're all a part of the same human family. Uh, we need to see each other as family. Um, and that strength came out of the churches. So virtually all of our meetings took place in churches. Um, all of the planning, all of the, and uh, the, uh, the um, sort of internal, uh, um, so the self-examination about what we were doing and why we were doing it. And the reason for that was because the church was the only place that people could go where they had a sense of freedom, uh, where they were allowed to be themselves. Outside of that, um, you couldn't walk on the same sidewalk with a white person. You had to step down into the street and the white person got to walk on the sidewalk. If you looked at a white woman and you were a black man for any period of time longer than just a split second, um, you would immediately be confronted um, and accused of some horrible sin. You couldn't drink from the same uh, drinking fountain. Uh, there were no, uh, they, you had separate uh, uh, schools for blacks and whites, um, uh, separate, all kinds of separate facilities. Uh, very same restaurant, there's a door over here for whites and a door over here for colored. Uh, and that of course all went all the way from um, registering to vote to being able to attend a school. So part of what we were doing was helping people, helping children uh, be able to go to uh, uh, a higher quality school. And when I'm talking higher quality, for example, Baker County, Georgia, um, the white school uh, exists in a building that looks something like this. It's about maybe this size, and it's made out of concrete, and there are desks and chairs, and there are books for the children. The black school is in a little uh, wooden shack. Um, there are no desks. Uh, there are only a couple of chairs, and there are no books. No books in the school. So. This is an example of what life was like on a real basis for people. Um, and so what that taught me, really, um, was uh, in the first place, um, well, let me take a, a one step back because I'm coming to you here to talk to you a little bit about conflict. And this is an example of social conflict. Um, but the conflict wasn't experienced only um, by large groups of people, it was individual by individual um, and family by family. And what I realized through the course of this was that it was possible to do something about your conflicts to make a difference. And I do believe in my heart that I made a difference. Uh, it was a small one. Uh, and fortunately, there were a lot of other people like me who did the same thing, and we did actually uh, create schools for children. Uh, we did actually get people registered to vote, which was important in order to have uh, some of the resources available to them. We integrated uh, the restaurants, uh, the swimming pools, the drinking fountains, all of those things took place. But what we didn't do was we didn't reach deeply enough into the hearts and minds of the people who lived there. So we didn't stop prejudice, discrimination, bias, stereotyping. Um, we didn't stop the, the basic feeling um, that somehow we are superior to other people. So um, what I recognized is that there are certain tactics that you can use that will take you a certain distance, 
But in order to get a farther distance, you have to do something differently. And um, so I became a lawyer in order to serve the, uh, uh, the civil rights movement and the various, uh, these various uh, uh, things that I believed in and worked in that field for a period of time. But the law also, as John will tell you, uh, has limitations. Um, it is win-lose. You go to court and you win or you lose. Uh, well, why, is that always necessary? And of course we know from family life um, that it isn't necessary that somebody lose in order for someone else to win. This is really a part of what all of us experience in our families. What we're looking for is not somebody else's defeat. What we're looking for is all of us to kind of rise together. And that's a very different approach. Um, and it was something that came out of this, the civil rights movement, the idea that uh, whites didn't have to lose in order for blacks to gain something everybody could rise together. And uh, it, uh, I'll just tell you a short story about how that happened in Baker County, Georgia. Um, there was a minister uh, who came down, who was from the Union Theological Seminary uh, in uh, the North, and a black minister, his name is Charles Sherrod, and he was one of the most amazing human beings I've ever met. Uh, and he worked in Baker County, Georgia, uh, and under the most um, terrifying conditions, and when I say terrifying, I mean terror, uh, police terror against the black community um, and against anybody who, who, who supported this uh, uh, the, uh, idea of equality. So what happened is uh, Reverend Sherrod came in and uh, got together with the various black farmers uh, who were in the area. There were white farmers and black farmers working more or less next to each other. Um, and this is a place where the, the county um, consists of, for example, a family called the Halls. Well, there are the White Halls, and there are the Black Halls, and there are the White Millers, and there are the Black Millers. And the reason is because many years before, uh, the white slave owners had slept with the various slave women who worked on their plantations and they had children, uh, many of them uh, as white as you are, um, called high yellow uh, in the South. But it means basically you're, for all appearances, you are white, except that everybody knows that you're actually black, right? So it became very, it was very confusing. But what happened was they were all working more or less side by side, the farmers were, um, and the uh, Sherrod had an idea, which was to raise money uh, through the connections that many of us had in the North in order to create a farmer's cooperative. And the farmer's cooperative purchased a state-of-the-art tractor. Um, and immediately, all the white farmers wanted to join the black organization, right? And uh, segregation just disappeared because they had the tractor. And the tractor was really important and it could improve their production and their quality of life and everybody knew this. So that was kind of how it began. And Charles Sherrod is still working in Baker County, Georgia, married one of the members of the Black Miller family. Um, and uh, that cooperative st is still operating in that area with black and white members working together. Can I uh, come in and look back a bit to your mention of the churches and the church's roles? Can you say a little bit more about the significance of church roles and also the importance of the yeah. role that individuals within the church played at that time as maybe the only recourse for folks who were struggling. Uh, this is, uh, it's a little hard to um, imagine living in an um, environment of pretty much continual terror. Um, the only place where you were safe 
where you knew that you were safe was in the church. And um, uh, the what uh, I think the reason for that was because this was a place where the uh, white uh, community was unable to say, well, you're not allowed to join a church. They couldn't really say that because they uh, felt that they were Christian. Uh, they felt the churches were important. Um, and they couldn't deny the black members of their community the ability to go to the church. So the ministers in the South uh, created a, sorry about that, uh, 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 really were spearheaded this movement. Martin Luther King Jr., Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., uh, uh, I went to his church uh, in Montgomery, Alabama, where I also worked. Uh, and uh, at another point, I worked in southern Alabama, and we were attacked by uh, the uh, local Ku Klux Klan, which is a kind of uh, really... White supremacist uh, group. Yeah, it's yeah. A, it really is a terrorist organization designed to strike terror into the hearts of people who want to change things. Um, and so we were attacked by the Ku Klux Klan, the police were assisting them, tear gassed everyone, and we, where did we go? Right into the church. And they didn't follow us into the church, so we, held, we were trapped in the church for about six days until finally the FBI arrived and got us out. Uh, and they had dog, attack dogs and all sorts of things surrounding the church. If it had not been for the church, uh, we would have uh, been in much more serious trouble. So the church was literally a sanctuary, a real sanctuary. Uh, yeah. As to what extent was the church itself um, confused about all of this? Oh yeah. Uh, but I suspect that not all churches served as unconditional sanctuaries, no. as they tend not to do in times of real complexity and difficulty. Yes, of course. They're, they're, um, uh, I think you can imagine that it must take an enormous amount of courage to stand up against something like this. Uh, and for the ministers, this was a challenge. Um, some of them were able to and some of them were not. And we're not talking about um, sort of the, just the courage of sort of uh, standing up to disapproval. We're talking about being shot, like Medgar Evers. Uh, men, a number of ministers were killed and shot, uh, or uh, beaten up, um, attacked. Uh, the man who I worked with in uh, Albany, Georgia, uh, C.B. King, uh, was uh, had his head split open uh, by the police and um, every time we went into some you know uh, into one of the little communities something would happen to his car it would be people would take their keys and scratch his car they would pour sugar in his gas tank they would uh, cover it with paint they would paint slogans on it, every, virtually every time we went somewhere, that was something, one of the things that happened. Um, and the other piece of it was that in the church there was an opportunity for meditation, mm -hmm. uh, for song, and singing uh, ends up being really, really important when you're frightened. Um, uh, when uh, you feel insecure, when, when in order to, for you to not feel completely alone, you join together in song. And that feeling of joining together in song was very powerful. And those songs kept us alive. Um, they gave us strength. Um, so it's, um, it's very difficult to face things like this individually, but when you face them together, when you feel united with each other, when somebody's got your sides and your back, um, you feel much more uh, capable. Can I, simply because time is, is, is limited, move you forward now to the Vietnam War and your involvement in that, some of the things that happened to you and some of the further discoveries and learning that you accumulated in that experience can. What was it that, that drove you to what was again a, a passionate and I think significant role in the 
anti-war movement, particularly I think on behalf of GIs. Can you say a little bit about that and mm -hmm. what was behind your thinking and what further you, you learned and experienced in that time? Well, once again, I think that this tracks back to some basic human values. Um, uh, thou shalt not kill. Um, that's kind of basic. But more importantly, growing out of the, uh, this experience of nonviolence, uh, and it isn't just nonviolence, it's nonviolent resistance to inhuman behavior, treating other people inhumanly. Um, and uh, the difficulty was that we were involved in this war in Vietnam um, and people were dying. Um, it began really with um, uh, uh, people in the U.S. being uh, called up in a draft uh, to serve in the United States military in a war that really uh, people had no idea what it was, what it was there, what it was for, why they were fighting. Um, and once again, there was a lot of conflict over this. Uh, my own feeling was that um, uh, this was not a, a war that could be justified. There may be wars that can be justified. My own belief about this is uh, that uh, taking another human life is a massively, um, uh, what would I say, um, kind of... Uh, a, 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 a problematic choice. Uh, if, I think if you have to face that choice, um, you're changed as a result of having faced it. Um, but what we tried to do essentially was to help the uh, GIs who were going to Vietnam um, f uh, express their opposition to the war and to do something different. So I worked with, uh, I represented GIs and courts martial. I represented uh, many of the different uh, peace organizations and um, worked with uh, people who were uh, going to Canada or various other places to escape the military. Uh, but basically what we were looking for um, ended up being something really fundamental. It's sort of like the, this human rights idea. Uh, it's about peace. And what peace basically consists of, at a deep level, is a recognition that it is possible for us to resolve our differences without violence. That's the fundamental part of this. So in a way, it was in the next step in this. And it led me in the direction of conflict resolution, which is what I do today. And I very deeply believe um, it's my practice on a daily basis. I work with thousands of people, um, have worked with thousands of people in resolving conflicts, married couples, uh, uh, families, communities, companies, organizations, <coughs> etc. cetera. Um, even within countries, I have done this type of work. And there are more difficult conflicts and less difficult conflicts, but even in the most difficult conflicts imaginable, it is possible for people to shift their approach to those conflicts in a way that turns it in a constructive direction, um, that allows people to see each other as human beings, which makes it very difficult um, to then kill them. Uh, there's, in fact, there's a, a Chilean writer whose name is Ariel Dorfman. He was uh, arrested under uh, General Pinochet during the period when uh, there was the dictatorship in Argen in Chile. And he um, was imprisoned and tortured. And he wrote, um, see if I can remember it, um, uh, how easy it is to kill someone who you never bothered to imagine alive but to imagine another person, to see them as a real other, as a human being, as your brother, your sister, uh, means that uh, you no longer uh, can justify um, doing violence to them. And now the question becomes, what do we do about our differences? If there isn't an answer to that, 
people will become frustrated and sooner or later they will get into conflicts with each other and those conflicts will become more and more violent. So what